Hi friend, Niklas here from Your Audio Solutions. Hope you are doing well and welcome to today's episode. On the show today, we have drummer and record producer Greg Erico. Now, you might have heard the band he played in. It was a little band called Sly and the Family Stone. And he joined them actually when he was only 17, having played drums for like three years or something, which is crazy. Um, but he joined Sly and the Family Stone, which I'm sure you've heard of, um, around 66 or something. When um, And he was on their first record called A Whole New Thing. And he stayed until 71 for There's a Riot going on. And it was a huge pleasure talking to Greg uh, because Sly and the Family Stone has been a huge inspiration for me and I'm sure many of you guys who are watching and listening. So it was an awesome, awesome pleasure talking to Greg and I hope you really like our conversation as well. Uh, now, Greg didn't only actually play with Sly and the Family Stone as that wouldn't be enough for some. Uh, <laughs> but after Sly and the Family Stone, he played with David Bowie Re um, weather Report and um, Carlos Santana and many, many others. So Greg has had a fantastic career. Um, but yeah, I hope you're going to enjoy our conversation. And if you haven't heard Sly and the Family Stone, I can recommend that you go check them out right now. Pause this video, go check them out on Spotify and enjoy some awesome music. And a really cool thing about Sly and the Family Stone is when they came out or when they released their first record, there was nothing else like them. So they were really unique and um, like they had a female, like a mix of male and female members in the band, interracial, so black and white. And uh, if you know Larry Graham, the, the, the bass player who was famous for inventing the slap technique, he was also in the band. So there was a lot of cool things going on with Sly and the Family Stones. They were real trendsetters and a new unique band. Um, so very, very cool. But we we'll talk more about that in the interview. Now, do you want exclusive access to interviews before the public? Do you want to be a part of the conversation? Do you want to be able to ask questions to up and coming guests and much more? Then all you have to do is join the Audio Tribe. There's a link to it in the description below. Just click on it, enter your name and email address, and you have joined the Audio Tribe. Um, it's super simple. It's free, of course. Uh, and I'll send you free content before the public gets it. Uh, and we're going to do some more cool stuff in the future. Hopefully some cool live Q&As and stuff like that. So click the link. In <laughs> That's a lot of rambling, but click the link in the description below and you are in. Also, feel free to subscribe to the YouTube channel, Apple Podcasts or Spotify or wherever you are listening or watching this podcast. Uh, it will help grow the channel and get cool, more cool guests on uh, and all that sort of good things. So I'd love to see you join and subscribe to the channel. But that's it. Let's get into the interview with Greg Erico. But yeah, I mean, the, the fires in, in California, there was something last year, two years ago, too, that was just awful. And obviously... Well, yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, it's, yeah, it's, it's exactly. shit. <laughs> uh, there's a, play, there's a, a, a town called, a little town up in the mountains called Paradise. Oh, yeah, 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 exactly. And that just was it was devastating. So they're, and they're, they're running again. I mean, it's, it's the same thing again. You would think that everything burned, but... Um, whatever the case. And there's many more. Hmm. It's just hmm. that, uh, you know, there's, it's, it's a combination of things that have come together. It's kind of like the perfect storm of all the wrong elements. <clears throat> and, uh, it's, it's pretty nasty. You know, we, we got drought, we got a third of the forest here in California is diseased, dead, you know? Hmm. So they're drier, the hotter temperatures, no rain, and all that all come together once. And then you got a lightning storm that came through here a month ago. Hmm. Dry lightning, no rain. Wow. 10,000 hits, 10,000 strikes. Wow. Yeah. And yeah. some, I, don't, I forget how many fires, it was like 400 fires. <laughs> wow. and, then they, and then everything just kind of explodes hmm. with wind and it's like a torch. It's yeah. Crazy. I mean, yeah. it's, it's, it's fucked up to us because, I mean, obviously it's, it's climate change and oh, you know, yeah. I don't want to talk shit about U.S., but I mean, you know, it's a shame to see where the country has headed or is heading or whatever is going, you know. 
<laughs> talk shit. Talk shit. You're, you're <laughs> yeah. Fine right now. You know, you got to go through the, the, sometimes you, you know, it's like mm-hmm. a roller coaster, you know, but uh, yeah, exactly. it's just, it's just crazy time, you know, and, uh, but, but, you know, I think we'll get through it. And, uh, and this is a kind of like a wake up call to get everybody on the same page and, um, Holy and get yeah. people with the, the wrong agenda and, and the people that just don't care, you know, or just all concerned with their own agendas and stuff and they don't mm-hmm. care about it, you know. Mm-hmm. The big picture, they got to go. <laughs> you yeah, know what I mean? Exactly. It's, 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 it's just about brain. It's, you know, Ray, Ray Charles could see that. God bless him. <laughs> right, 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 right. I mean, exactly, man. But yeah, I mean, let's let's focus something on something more fun, I guess. Uh, yeah. That's not going to kill right. us <laughs> in the near future. Music. Uh, yeah, exactly. Um, I mean, obviously, I've been listening to, you know, you guys, Sly and the Family Stone, since I started out the music, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago. Um, but are, I'm you just drum- been... are you a drummer? Yeah. Uh, guitarist, bass player. Oh, uh, cool. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, yeah. So Larry That's Graham cool. was a big inspiration, obviously. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I was just listening, listening to your music again and just, you know, going back, the, um, going back listening to the catalog and, you know, like songs, for example, I Want to Take You Higher, you know, you and yeah. Graham, man, you're just, you're just slaying it, the two of you, to be honest. Like, it's the same rhythm, but... That's what I love about that song. It's just the same thing. It's, it's a train. It just keeps going. And you guys are just, it just goes better, you know? Like every you, bar, the groove increases, increases, increases. It's Yeah, you use the very word that Prince used, train. Mm. And, you know, quite frankly, uh, I was conscious. It, it felt like that back when we did it, which was way before Prince. Mm. But I would say, yeah, it had that... Um, it was like me and Larry used to talk about, like, that locomotive was there tonight, man, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and then it was interesting because that group knew how to make records, knew how to record, mm-hmm. but knew how to play live, too. And they really are different things. Mm-hmm. You know, sometimes you perform a record, a recording, like it is, like mm-hmm. you recorded it. Mm-hmm. Sometimes that don't work. Right. And... Or even if it works uh, on a live platform, you you find places to go with it that just you can't really do on a recording. Mm. There's some elements that, and there's some situations that exist to allow you to go there. And if you're able to go there, it's amazing. That was one of them. Mm. That's definitely one of them. You know, it, 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 you could do that with that song. Yeah. It's just all energy. Yeah. You know? Definitely. I mean, because obviously you guys recorded live i guess right like it was a live in the studio well um yes and no hmm. so yeah we would record our tracks and 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 usually you know everybody would you know be there but you know like even horns and not all the time i mean in other words sometimes you would just you 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 create stuff you know and then uh so once you get the good a good rhythm track, then usually horns will be overdubbed right, right. again, and maybe even different lines and the, the songs would morph. Mm. So they were like individual living things. You know, you 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 laid it down. Most of the time, then you would develop it. Especially Sly, he had the chops. He was a great producer, mm-hmm. and um, you know he really knew how to do that. And so, um, yeah, you, you there were live tracks, but then. You know, everything was overdubbed. You know, you had had horns again. You right. embellish maybe with, you know, guitar lines, solos, and then vocals and everything put on. And um, on all those recordings, especially the singles, hmm. um, I would go back in and I would record the drums at once again. Right. Because, because, especially again with the singles, because they were, you know, polished and, you know, they would change, and sometimes even the feel would change. So I'd go in and put cans on. This is before, you know, click tracks and drum machines and all that stuff, you know. Mm-hmm. And I would re-record the drums and just hone in on the verses and choruses and just the feel and just lock it down. Right. And then we'd mix. Right. So all the singles, right? Album cuts? No, never did it. Right. Uh, except for... Um, Sex Machine, which was an mm-hmm. instrumental, mm-hmm. was not a single. And, of course, I overdubbed the drum solo. Right. Uh, I didn't do that in real time. You know, I, I performed it after the fact. Right. 
So yeah. what do you think you gained by going back and re-recorded re-recorded drums on the single? Uh, on well, you know, uh, the singles were like especially with. You know, Sly was a good writer, and so you know you had you had this music that was unusual, but you had uh, stories and lyrics and vocal parts that were you know e equally. So um, things were very things were very you know you could if you're if you're capable of lifting that performance that you already captured, hmm. and really now you end up with a song. This wasn't just the jam that you did that you started out right, with right, or right. Kind of relayed. It becomes the song. It becomes a really special thing with all these really unique elements mm -hmm. that you could really shine a light on and really focus in and look at it and take it apart. And go, damn, that's you know, cool, and and it all fits together. So uh, it, it was worth digging in and making that effort to do that, right. as opposed to leaving it like it was. It was cool, right, right. but no, you could really make this special, you know. Right. And, I, and I guess that's part of what made some of those recordings mm -hmm. special, you know. Definitely. I mean, yeah. I, I heard you talk about, you know, like less is more and the importance of less is more. Um, mm -hmm. But how, how did you approach that in, in a real life situation where, let's say, whoever, like Sly came with you with a track, like here's an idea. Right. How did you, you know... How did you take that mentality and actually apply it? Um, it's a mindset, so you don't have to. It's, it's it's kind of like an unconscious effort. It's just there. It's your it's your mindset. You're you're looking for that to exist, meaning that you have to always be open to where you know some of the greatest stuff are the spaces between the notes. Mm. Well, they set up mm -hmm. what happens, mm -hmm. and without that space. Well, what happens kind of goes by, and it's maybe less significant. But if you, if if all of a sudden there's silence, uh, just unconsciously, a listener, you know, like, what? There's nothing. What's going to happen? And yeah, then yeah, all yeah. Of this thing happens. You go, oh shit! Yes. <laughs> like, why wow, you get chill bumps? You know. Mm. So um, yeah, the spaces are, or the, the silence, and the, the rests in between notes. Are just as important as the notes, if not more. Sometimes mm. it, it, it could be very effective. Yeah, definitely. Sly and I used to talk about, you know, in a group. You know, you you just you 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 go to funny places like just with humor and just boredom and or creativity mm. and everything in between. And you talk about funny things. So we used to talk about. Uh, what if there was, you know, you had some manuscript paper, you know, some you're writing music on, hmm. and it's all black, and then you get a, an eraser, and you turn it around, I mean, you get a pencil, and you turn it around to the eraser, and you start creating spaces, hmm. and st instead of getting a blank piece of paper, st you start out with, and you start writing down, you know, your stuff, you approach it from the other way, and it's a cool, it's a good exercise. Mm -hmm. Good perspective to have, you know, Definitely. if you're writing, just to have that thought. Oh, yeah, it yeah. kind of goes the you know the spaces between the notes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's that's really, yeah, that's, that's a great analogy to be honest. Yeah, uh, I mean, this might be a, a bad, not a bad reference, but you know, thinking about less is more because I know you started playing drums when you were like 14 and you joined. I mean, you joined Sly and those guys 17, 18. Is that also? Yeah. I mean, yeah, first of all, how, how, how in three years were you able to, you know, do some kick-ass, you know, join a kick-ass band, you know? I mean, what, what did you practice or what didn't you practice? I, is a better I, question, just, I guess. I, I loved drums from, little, from when I was, you know, a little kid. Mm -hmm. I, and I used to just look on the weekends, I'd get catalogs and look at the magazines, and, you know, and music stores were selling drums and I, I used to... I used to go down on the weekend to downtown in San Francisco to the music stores and just hang out all day and, you know, mess with all this stuff, and drums, keyboards, whatever. And, uh, but I wasn't able to actually get a set and start playing. Um, uh, I, I suppose I could have took lessons and, you know, got a practice pad and, because my folks didn't want any, 
they, they weren't supporting a drum set around the house. Right, right, right. <laughs> because of the upheaval that probably, yeah, yeah would create. <clears throat> so that didn't happen until I had got a little job and I saved some money and I got my own drum set. And, you know, I started to come of age, you know, and I said, I'm going to do this, you know what I mean? But um, I was never interested in, 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 in um, just, you know, taking le le lessons and, and, and sitting on a pad and doing rudiments and stuff. Right. I wanted to play music. I was, mm -hmm. Music turned me on. The drums turned me on. The look of them, the sound of them, the feel of, you know, feeling when you're, when you're playing them. Mm -hmm. So that's how it went down. And uh, she, believe me, I don't know. It's just right place, right time. Um, I at first... I started playing. I was, I was practicing with records like, you know, um, uh, Ray Charles and um, Big Band Buddy Rich. I'd listen to, I'd listen to um, Take Five, you know, and, you know, stuff and, and, dip, and all the time signatures. And, and I play long stuff and practice with it. So about when I was um, 16, I had met Freddie, his like brother, and we we started the group. Mm -hmm. Sly had a radio show at that time. Uh, he was a DJ, <laughs> a great, very creative radio show. Mm. Very, very he played R and B, soul music. It was called then R and B. Right. And um, but we had a group for about a year, and then uh, and then that kind of morphed into, you know, when we started the Family Stone. Mm. Um, Sly kind of had handpicked. He had tried a couple of different things on putting a group together that he wasn't pleased with, and so he had kind of handpicked everybody. And this just they he hadn't told me. Freddie hadn't told me that they were planning on doing. You know, he was talking to his brother. We were planning on putting something together, right, right. and showed up one night for rehearsal with the Stone Souls, the group that Freddie and I had. And uh, everybody showed up from from the band that night for the first time, met each other for the first time, and. That's when it happened, you know. Hmm. It's kind of like unbeknownst <laughs> to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I and mean, that worked, you know. But do, do you think because you did it in such a short time, so to speak, that that made you having to force on the important things, which is, again, going back to the less is more, like maybe you didn't have the, the enough time to become that flashy drummer because you, you there was such a short time from starting out to actually making music? Do you think that has anything to do with it? or? or no, it's just kind of like, uh, you know, in those days, I mean, first of all, we didn't, we didn't follow any path. Right. Hopping anything that, it, I mean, other than, you know, in, things that influence, are obviously, are, and, you know, you, you, you take them and you own them. But I mean, that group from the, in, from the outset was, was, unique and different and kind of like an experiment of, you know, and a challenge too, you know? Hmm. So, um, I mean, you know, if it was flashy or if it was whatever it was, hmm. these were unconscious things that were just as a result of, you know, the combination of elements that were coming together. Right. Right. Whether it be conscious or unconscious, hmm. I believe, because, you know, uh, I mean, even, even you figure, well, geez, I'm going to put a group together and, and, and Sly is on a, he's on the radio. So we got access to the radio and, you know, right, he's right. a producer and he already had produced some hit records with other artists and stuff mm. like that. Oh, this is just a no brainer. No, it's not a no brainer. It's not, it's not a given. And actually there were a lot of challenges and a lot of people, we didn't have a lot of support uh, with there's people saying, Oh yeah, this is cool. And it was more like, oh, you know, you, you mix in, you know, you mix in male and female and just all the, you know, black and white and mm -hmm. added where there was like racial things going on in the country. And, play, you know, you're making these statements that are way outside the box. This ain't going to fly, you know. Right, right, right. Yeah. I'm, I'm summarizing that in a big way. But, you know, what I mean, in other words, it wasn't support. Hmm. We had a few small handful of fans that dug what we we're doing. And that's it. Um, but. The music, you know, once the music came together and, and that's what makes, that's what made the statement that we were making right. uh, valid hmm. because it spoke for itself. Mm -hmm. You know, it was really different. It excited us. 
you know, we're, we're uh, fans of ourselves, too, because we're, we're doing something that's challenging. But when we get together, it feels good. It's comfortable. And it's just undeniable. You don't, you know, you know, it's just like you, you kind of stay out of its way and let it go and, and, and take the challenges on as they come. Mm. And um, it was very cool. It was, it was you know. I, he, yeah, it, you guys created a whole new new genre. I mean. I yeah. mean, it was you guys. I mean, then Funkadelic came. Was it after you or a similar time, maybe? After. Right. Everything everything was after. You know, the Carved Delight. You know, it was the first album, <clears throat> it's called The Whole New Thing. Mm-hmm. I love the album, A Whole New Thing, mm-hmm. because it's simply what it was. Right. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that, that's pretty, you know, exciting and obviously super unique to do something unique, <laughs> obviously. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, because I heard you speak about like um, you, you guys did a show on the Ed Sullivan show, which was big back then, right? Um, Ed Sullivan was, you know, um, this is mid '60s. Ed Sullivan was huge. You know, you got to put it in perspective. And not only you know being, yeah, it was the big T. It was kind of like Par- Parky. Hmm. He, Parky was the Ed Sullivan of the UK. You know, right, right, right. Ed Sullivan was, you know, there were three stations. There wasn't 500 stations to choose from, mm-hmm. and cable and internet. None of that existed. There were only three stations. And in some countries, you only had one station, mm-hmm. you know, it was usually government owned. Here there were three stations. And uh, on Sunday night at eight o'clock, when that was called prime time, mm-hmm. when it came on, He's, you know, it was it was a phenomenon. I mean, that's he's part of the chemistry of what made Elvis Presley <clears throat> mm. access the whole world to right. change his music. Right, right. The Beatles access mm. the whole world. I remember the first time I seen both of them. The mm. first night of Elvis. I remember where I was. That was about five years old. And then the first time I seen the Beatles. Right, right. And there was you know, was all the yeah. Neil Sullivan show. It's a good show. Right, right. He, you know, he's if you look at the history, he's he's the mechanical part of what created the phenomenon. Mm. You know, mm. but yeah. what what changed for you guys after that show? Because I know you you spoke about like a you know very you know game changing moment that was you know after that show. So how how did it change the band going forward? It didn't necessarily change the band. It just was kind of like. Um, Okay, everyone gets it now. You know, so what you were doing, you didn't change what you were doing. We didn't change what you were doing necessarily other than, you know, I mean, when we change what we were doing was just a natural process is going along when you're creating, you know, you're always adjusting and making changes and creating new things. Mm-hmm. So that show didn't necessarily go, oh, okay, this is new now. You know, we're going to do this. We're gonna... No, we just continued on our path. But right. everybody all of a sudden was listening. Mm-hmm. So it was the difference between we were playing and, you know, dance and music had already been. So we had like a, a first single yeah, that was right. getting attention and it was on the airwaves and all that. Mm. But, you know, you'd go play concerts and or, or, or you know, you'd play a performance. And sometimes, you know, the people weren't getting it. Mm. It was just like they're there, but we're not connecting yet, you yeah, know. Yeah. So all of a sudden that presence you know and that inertia of everybody seeing you once it's like everybody's there's the, you're 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 on everyone's conscious mm. but now they're what are you doing i'm listening now okay what are you doing you know it's kind of like that so you you're feeling it when you you do a performance like, oh they're listening now and then of course that i think accelerates your creativity yeah yeah Be- it, rather than being careful to get outside too far outside and you lose the audience mm-hmm. now now you're feeling that inertia they're listening and so you're going places and mm-hmm. you're you know you kind of feel like feel the 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 straps are let loose you know yeah, yeah, yeah. run faster now you know yeah, yeah. That, that's the way i could put it you know? i mean did, did you guys always have faith that it would that you that it would work out so to speak that people would eventually get it or was there ever uh, yeah. doubts within yourself? I, I, I yeah, we we did. We got. It was like you know when when we we're faced with more challenges than wins, hmm. uh, we knew that 
we felt good about it. You know, we created, created something that we're feeling now, and we go, this, yeah, this is this is special. I mean, this will get. I know it's, it's difficult. No, no one's really paying attention yet, but we got to. This feels too good. Hmm. So that is what drives you to continue to do it. You know, right. you don't have that. You know, you you, you ain't going to make it through the the tests, so to speak. Exactly. But we definitely had that. And we knew we had all these elements that were a challenge to people or a challenge to society. You know, we're, we, we have a group of people that are coming together to create and getting along and feeling good about it and, and presenting something new that's uplifting and positive. Hmm. And uh, at, at a time where... Um, everyone needed that. You know, you could feel that there's a need for this and that there's a value there, so stick with it, even though maybe if you can't uh, intellectually explain it all or mm. rationalize or whatever, that's, really, that's the power of music, you know yeah, what I mean? Definitely. You, it's it's it's, um, it's a, a spirit that you could um, uh, open up to let run through you that, that will do that. Mm. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it, it is, you know, I mean, I never really thought about it. I mean, until speaking to you now, like how, how different you guys were. I mean, not just, you know, <clears throat> being female, females in the band, you know, mixed with men, black and white, interracial band, so to speak. But also musically, I'm just thinking about like Larry Graham, because he's, he's usually credited with, you know, inventing the slap technique on the bass. Uh, yeah. I mean, how was, how was that, you know, hearing him do Because I don't know if had you ever heard anything like that before. No, it didn't exist before, and and he's explained uh, um, how it came about for him. Mm -hmm. You know, it was kind of like uh, when he used to play with his mom. Yeah, exactly. Mom had a trio. It was an organ, B three organ trio, and the drummer, uh, who was a female drummer, had got sick or something. You know, and so. She uh, says, Larry, you know, you got to kind of play some rhythm with, 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 with the bass lines tonight because I, for, I forgot her name. Right? She's not going to be here tonight, you know. Right, right. So right. It's, it kind of started out really, you know, um, just innocently <laughs> like that. And it became, a, so he became conscious of being able to uh, play rhythm with the melodic instrument where it's more of a dominant uh, presence as opposed to just, you know, implied or anything. Mm. But then um, putting that with, uh, I'd have to say, putting that with, with, with a drummer mm -hmm. and with, with, you know, musical presentation, you really got to be sensitive to how it's going to work. It can't just be like, you can't force it. Mm. So Larry was capable and, and conscious and sensitive enough to take that challenge and and make it work. And quite frankly, I mean, we never used to talk about our um, the way we met together. You know, it just was a natural thing. Mm. You know, people think, "Geez, boy, how did you come up with that stuff?" You know, would you? We it was just natural. We didn't talk about it. We just we had a good. The chemistry was obviously uh, right, and um, we just used to do it. We would talk about it after, like, wow, what's, you know, maybe we would, not not too much, though, you know, we would want to leave it alone, you know what I mean? Right. You know. <laughs> I mean, do you think also, because if I'm not mistaken, Sly made you rehearse for crazy hours, right? Did We used to rehearse a lot, yeah. Mm -hmm. When we first got together, we were playing before hours, after hours, and in between we'd rehearse. Mm -hmm. After, sometimes we would rehearse, like to the wee hours in the morning. What was the benefit of that? Did it help? Well, sure. Um, yeah, you're, you know, rehearsing, going over something is, is to be comfortable with, even if, you know, I mean, we would rehearse stuff, but also in our performances were, it wasn't stuck to where, okay, you rehearsed it like this and, you know, you, you can't change anything. Mm. No, we actually, when we played, it would always be a little bit different. We'd always be open for something that happened that you could develop. And, well, that's cool. Let's, let's, let's focus on that for a minute, mm. you know, a different way. But, uh, you know, rehearsing is just kind of like practicing for, for a, 
you know, if you're, if you're on a football team or you're on a baseball team, you know, you're, right, you, right. you're pra- it's called practice there. Mm-hmm. Or, or it's called rehearse, you know. You're going over, you're making, you're doing your moves and you're fine tuning everything. And it's also, you got to keep those physical things up, especially mm-hmm. with drums. Uh, then you call it practice, you know, with drums uh, because it's a very physical thing. And then, so all your parts got to be working good, you know, and you just get more comfortable with it. And, you know, so when, when it comes time to a, for performance, you know, you're not in the way of any, there's no, you know, physical challenges or emotional or anything. It's just like you're, you're on this, you're on this flow mm. level high. Right, right. But did you also do, you used to do that before recording the albums then? Like, was the album super rehearsed or was it? No. Yeah, right. No. No. A lot of the stuff we, you know, we come up with on the spot. Mm-hmm. Some of the stuff, uh, there was an idea or, you know, kind of a, a, a template. But everything was always, o- everything that not only was open for development and morphine, uh, but that was part of the process. I mean, you know, you'd lay something down, an idea down, and you develop it, change it. Thank you, for instance, hmm. was um, which quite. I mean, that's that track is like it, it still stands up very powerful today. Hmm. Um, uh, it it changed. I could play you versions of it that you. That's thank you. It's got nothing to do with where it ended up. Right, right, right. There's a you know thought of like Sly was hearing something and trying to get something, but it took a lot of peeling Shape off the layer. Yeah. No, it's not there. It's over here somewhere. And then finally you get there. You know, right. I remember when we first was were satisfied with okay, this is the fine. This is the track. Mm-hmm. But he, uh, I remember him saying, "I'm going to go." For about two weeks, she ain't gonna see me. I'm going in the studio, locking the doors. No one's disturbed me. No one's nothing, you know. And when I come out, I am confident that I'm gonna blow your mind. Yeah, and, this, yeah. <laughs> and it did. I mean, he really, he really was feeling that strong. But it took a lot of uh, swipes, you mm. know, to get to get at it. But that's and, the beautiful thing with with, with writing songs because. In my own experience, writing my own songs, like you think you have something good, but if if you didn't go like, I think I can do better, and you keep going over it, yeah, something better can usually come. That's that's a pretty cool yeah, thing. Yeah, kind of like you gotta you gotta stay out, you gotta remain open and stay out mm. of your own way, not knowing. Oh, I just I wrote a great song, and then and, 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 you know, and, and then you you close up like listening to uh, someone mm. like. Wow, you know, add something to it, and that's what that's what the creative process is. You know, it's where everybody bringing their perspective and ideas to the table. Mm-hmm. Um, exactly. Given did, did the, Sly used to uh, did he did he bring in the songs or how, how did you guys write the songs? Was he the he was the main writer? Was he? Yes. Yeah. Right. But you guys yeah. were allowed to express, like you you yeah. made up the drums, for example. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we talked sometimes about uh, you know different ideas and different approaches, but it was uh, he left, and that's why this stuff is you know stands up and it's is it's because he was uh, he was encouraged you know you to bring you mm-hmm. in there, and as a matter of fact, a lot of Tom you know in the songwriting eventually it becomes. Um, uh, a good writer, well, especially when you, you have a band, uh, you're writing for the band, kind mm-hmm. of. Also, in other words, you're 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 thinking of your parts and your performances, and you know what the song has to have, has to offer uh, has a lot of consideration for each individual mm-hmm. to to be. Yeah, 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 yeah. exactly. Yeah. But did was he bring in a song on a on a um, uh, piano or a Rhodes or what was the main instrument he came in with? B three in the early days, you know, his right, keyboard. Right. Yeah, right, right, right. Keyboards, you know. Although, like you know, so hence, for example, uh, thank you. Hmm. <laughs> keyboards on it, it's all guitars. Right, 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 yeah, yeah. It's so it's like three guitar parts that are all counter 
counterpuntal, you know, these intricate rhythm things that are going on. Mm -hmm. it, it, and melodic. Uh, and that's what makes it interesting. So that was, you know, that was unique uh, as far as, you know, most of the songs, sort of, everything's keyboard. You know? Right, right, right. That's yeah. cool, man. Um, yeah. I mean, what was the recording experience? You know, when you guys recorded, was 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 there a lot of party? Or was it very focused, or what was the what was the vibe? More focused. Right. You know, we came here, we came here to work. Mm -hmm. I mean, and it was fun. It was fun to I me. Mean, we had fun too, but I mean, it was like uh, it, 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 you use the word party. Uh, because there were a lot of groups. I mean, at that time, you know, in San Francisco, there was a lot of, you know, there was a lot of groups that, yeah, it was a party, and that could have been even part of maybe the spirit of what what they were doing. It was kind of like, you know, but um, no, we we came to we came to work. I got there's a picture I can find it while I'm talking to you. Mm -hmm. uh, kind of it, it it shows you it sets the stage for what we just spoke of. Right, 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 right. You must have a, some, a nice collection of photos on your phone, I guess, from I the got, brutal days. <laughs> yeah, I got qu quite a collection, actually. And even, like, I have some film, too, Super 8 millimeter film. Wow, yeah, yeah, yeah. Video of, like, really the early days. Uh, I'll have to send you this. Uh -huh. uh, I'll have to share with you a thing that I was working on, just like with home movies, you know. It's right, pretty right, cool. Right. Yeah, 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 please do, man. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, so, you know, going, going back to you, because that was uh, late 60s, obviously. You guys started out. Um, when did it, you... December, uh, December of 1966 is when we started the group. Hmm. I mean, yeah. did, did you ever run into, like, bands like Funkadelic, On the Road, or did you ever cross paths with them? I don't know when it started, actually. I'm a bit... No. Uh, George came... It, it, he had a doo-wop group during that time. I mean, it was really called the, uh, uh, what was it called? The, not the Funkadelics. You know, that was, Funkadelics was later. Yeah, yeah. He had like a, you know, like a, you know, there were, you know, suits and right, 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 right. <laughs> street corner singing. And uh, he came like in the late, late 60s. Right, hmm. right, right. Yeah. I remember him telling the story when he first, because he was on uh, Columbia too, I think, at that time. And one of the a &R people, or it might have been Dave Kapolik, who was VP of, of Epic Records and who became our manager, um, he had a, he had played, uh, I guess it was the only thing, you know, for George. And he said, after hearing that, he just completely changed what he was doing mm. you know uh and that's when he got into the whole funkadelic thing and all that you know right and um <laughs> blank. i'm blank of boy i know i must have seen this picture a million times but right now i, I can't try to figure out where it is <laughs> that's fine man. It, it really will 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 say what we were talking about right, right. right. Perfect. But if you send it to me later, I can always um, yeah. put it in afterwards. Oh, okay, yeah, we could do that. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. Uh, but so, did you play on all, all the Sly records or did you, because I know you quit, but at what point did you quit the band? Well, that was, what, 71. So between December 66 when we started the group wow. and... Um, 71 when I left that five years we recorded most of the body of work hmm. uh, that the album that came out after I left was riot mm -hmm. but I'm on that still in the way of that we had recorded tracks that we had hadn't finished right and and so he had taken some of those tracks with the pressure of putting out another record he had taken some of those tracks and finished them right right right, right. So, you know, I ended up being on that album, too. Hmm. And then he did a couple more after that. And, right. you know. I mean, it's, it's crazy when you, th when you like a lot of bands back, back in the day, like you put out a lot of records, you know, like fast. It's not like today where it's like one record and eight years later it's the second record, you know. It was fast turnaround. Well, the, 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 the whole record industry is 
you know, it's totally different. It doesn't mm-hmm. exist like it used to. But even with that, yeah, I mean, it was intense because, you know, you get a record out there and then you start having pressure to to put more records up. But you're touring. Now you're touring all the time. We're you know, in the beginning, you had plenty of time. There's not many gigs, you know, and, you know, you go record. And now you got a tour schedule. You're all over the world. And, mm. and, um, and, when, and you know, recording, you know, it's it's not a casual thing. I mean, you, gotta, you need several days or even weeks to get into it, you know. Yeah. And so there's a lot of pressure becomes it's difficult you know yeah so exactly. so you, you uh, it's amazing that uh, yeah well, we were able to put out as much as we did under the real circumstances that existed you mm. know exactly yeah. now, what, what was the reason you, you did leave the band was it personal was it just musical it didn't work out anymore or was it I know, well, I, I know Sly he was falling into some some drugs if I'm not mistaken was that the case yeah, there was there was a lot, of, you know, the the focal point. I mean, in the early days of the band, I mean, it was really, it was all about the music, mm. and uh, and then you know at that point in time, you know, missing shows and the drugs and everything, it it the, the focal point I think changed and it became more about everything else and less about the music. And you know, there was just a lot of things that um, that were. A, a challenge and just you know i wasn't the music the music is what always drove me and kept it together you know mm-hmm. and so when this you started being you know less of that even showing up and playing you know it was like geez is he going to show up tonight and you know and then you got all these problems that happen as a result of that and and then you know uh, 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 the the whole mechanism and the whole machine that works, you know, which was was challenged by all these uh, things that were out of focus, mm. you know, as opposed to where the you know the music made everything right, um, right. right. in the earlier times, you know. Yeah. So then, you know, I got disillusioned, and right. finally I left for about a year. Matter of fact, I I didn't even play for about a year. Yeah, did he take like a? Did he go like on a motorcycle around the country? Yeah, I bought myself a Harley and nice. you know, and, and, and took off for a year. Yeah. yeah, how was that experience? That must have been refreshing. Oh, it was great, I guess. Right? Oh yeah, I enjoyed it. You know, yeah. and uh, it kind of like let me recreate, you know, and 100. recreate, right? Mm-hmm. And um, and then you know it was all, it's having all kinds of opportunities to go out and play again. So finally, I started answering the phone again, and yeah. it was cool. I had some wonderful experiences, you know. Yeah, I mean, because that's a you know a, a ballsy move, you know, actually to just be like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ride my motorcycle for a year now. I mean, were, were you never scared of maybe losing, losing your place in the business, or it was just fuck it. I kn- I never thought about it, you know, uh, right. if I would have thought about it, it probably would have been, you know, but I just never thought about it in that way. And, and, you know, I mean, uh, this was the kind of the mindset that was part of the attitude, which allowed me to do what I do, what I did in the first place. Hmm. So hmm. I, I mean, you know, because, uh, in actuality is what happened when I did go back and start playing again, I had some incredible opportunities and, and experiences to get with different artists and bands. Hmm. I mean, did you play playing in Weather Report? Was that the first gig after? Or was there some in between? No. Uh, I think the first thing was David Bowie, Diamond Dogs Tour. Ah, cool. That was the first thing. It was either that or it was going out with Peter Frampton when Frampton Comes Alive album came out, which is, which is, which is his big live album that he recorded at Winterland, San Francisco. Mm. Uh, I forgot which one was first. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. No. But there was a lot happening at that time. And then I got into production, too, and produced uh, Betty Davis's first record, you know, mm-hmm. and and used all the wonderful talent in, in the Bay Area that was available at that time. Yeah. And 
What what was the 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 eighties like then when when that came around in nineties? Were you still very busy then, or did you ever experience? A, a no, I slowed down. I started having kids. Got married. Started having kids, and I was still doing stuff, but not as much. And you know, times had changed, and the drum machine came into play, and mm. disco came into play, and you know. Um, so, you know, I, 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 I still did things, but I kind of like less, I did a lot less and it was, I, I think a lot, it was much less of a creative time than, than the time that I came, grew up in, you know, right. the late sixties and seventies were an anomaly, mm -hmm. I would say. <clears throat> and, um, and, and I think that stands to, uh, you know, I mean, the music from that period is still relevant today. Mm -hmm. Where a lot of the things that came came and went, you know, at, during the period you're talking about, '80s and '90s, you know, they were you heard it once, and you probably won't hear it again. Right. <laughs> yeah. So that was a really special time, and I was fortunate to be mm -hmm. in the right place, right time during that time. Yeah. You know? Yeah, definitely. I mean, there was a lot of magic, like, like you said. You know, there were so many important records that came yeah. out, and like, like you said, the people still listening to you and referring to. You know, um, yeah, it's 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 very interesting how that came together. You know, like, mm -hmm. you know, why did it come together, and why in California specifically? There was a lot of stuff there, obviously. Uh, it's interesting. What's your take on the whole that whole well, scene? You know. Uh, it wasn't so much California, it was San Francisco was mm. always kind of like its own thing, you know, and mm. was under the radar until the mid late sixties. I mean, all the musics that <clears throat> you were hearing were coming out of Los Angeles mm. or New York for the most part, right. you know, that business was, that's where you went to, you know, get into it. And, you know, if you were going to be successful, you had to kind of be in the place where it was all being developed, you know, mm. that, that's where the stew was being cooked, you know. <laughs> but San Francisco was always unique and uh, always had a lot of creativity and music, but it was just under the radar. It was the business wasn't here, so you know there was no lights being shined on it, you know. And it wasn't uh, so when that unique moment came, you know, it just exploded. I mean, and look at all the stuff that came out of her, mm -hmm. uh, Santana, The Grateful Dead, you know, yeah. start. An airplane, uh, Quicksilver, it's on and on and on and on. Exactly. Know? Yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's cool, man. You know, it's very, very interesting. Yeah. Um, but when, 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 like during the eighties and nineties, what do you have to do to make a living? You know, since production slowed down, maybe touring. Did did you get another job at some point, or what was the what was the deal? Uh, I had a couple things. I had I had a. Um, for a while, I, I had a limousine company with. Uh, <laughs> cool. <laughs> but I didn't. I, I kind of became a partner of his, and uh, the guy that owned it was in Palm Springs. I was living in L.A. at the time, hmm. so I did you know? So I, I didn't get too far out of it, which is kind of funny. Limousine them now. I'm kind of running people around. I used to go to the Grammys, uh, not for me. Right, right, right. <laughs> to the Grammys was kind of funny. I was kind of a weird experience, but yeah, I did that for a little while. And, you know, at the time my wife was working too. So, you know, I was able to get by and, you know, the business part of, um, of the success I had wasn't giving a good, in other words, <clears throat> I wasn't getting, you know, my share of what I was supposed to get. Yeah. I eventually had to go after that and, you know, in some case, cases never seen it. In some cases, you know, finally, you know, got my due. Mm. Um, so I was able to get by. Sometimes it was difficult. Right. Yeah, uh, valid question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, because, yeah. you know, those moments are always very defining, I think, of a person's career, right? Because yeah. either you, you quit maybe or, yeah, you decide to do something else. Uh, but what made you go through it, you know, like, was it a lot of what were you stressful were you were you just so focused that nothing mattered 
Well, pro- it would maybe survive through it, you mean? Is that mm. what you, yeah, you, yeah. Um, you know, I just found a couple of good ones. I'll show you. <laughs> uh, you know, just, you know, just, I, I you know, I, I, I don't even, I'm not sure how to answer that. It's just life, you know? Right. Uh, so I guess if I hadn't, you know, started a family and kind of had that focus, uh, it could have been different. Maybe... Maybe I wouldn't have got through it as good, or maybe it would have forced me to go back out and, and do something else musically. But I mean, I've always went and got involved in music music ventures um, because it felt good, and it was just you know, I, I never questioned that. Right, I never right, right. say, well, geez, I should have did it different. I mean, right. yeah, could have, but I did what I did, and mm-hmm. I, I don't have a problem with it. Yeah. You know, that's great. You know, to have that mentality. <laughs> I wish I, I wish I had some more of that. I think. <laughs> um, so, so here's a, the one I was thinking of that I wanted to show you. Yeah, yeah. That referred to our conversation earlier was more. If we were in the studio, and I'll find that. But here's one that's pretty cool. Sure. Yeah. Yes. We're in. That's cool, man. We're we're perform. We were up in Boston. Hmm. And so this was during the day and somebody's invited us over there to their, you know, like a barbecue or something. We're in the backyard. And right. I'm eating watermelon slice in there. This yeah. is what, this is like 67. This is early. This is like a, a year after we started the group, you know, hmm. we're on the road and we're back east. But there's one in the studio that is really, because you were talking about the studio. and uh-huh. damn. I'll find it. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Go that, on. That's a, that's a that's a awesome picture, man. I yeah. love seeing those. I think people love to see those pictures. You know, period. Uh, yeah. Where I mean, because you know, the difference between now and then, or well, one of the differences is, back then you didn't have uh, social media, so you couldn't see everything. There was only the music and a photo yeah. here and there. So you you had this whole mystique, right? That is missing today. Um, yeah. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm. Uh, yeah. It's 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 totally different ball game than it was back then. Yeah. I mean, you know, there's there's the upsides and there's the downsides to all this. That you're mm. saying, it, you know. Um. Yeah. But, but has, has the has the current climate allowed you to go back? Because do you play with the with some of the the Sly and the Family Stone members? now or up until about <clears throat> the pandemic two, maybe? Up, up until well let's see back i started putting together the family stone mm-hmm. different configurations back in the mid 2000 right and then uh 2006 uh Neris, the grammy people did you know they were uh, they honored the group so right, right, right. We did, you know, kind of like a, a comeback there, but uh, it, actually, here it is. Um, cool. Yeah. <laughs> oh, is that from the, the Grammys thing? That's the Grammys. Uh, that was on TV. You know, the the um, they did a tribute um uh, to the band and to Sly and, and you know we did a performance and um, but still here's an early here's a Ed Sullivan show cool oh there we go oh that's cool man yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> nice that's the first that's the first we did Ed Sullivan three times that's the first one oh okay the, yeah that's awesome, man. Hey, it's cool to see, see those photos, man. I still can't find the one that I wanted to show you. I'll find it. Yeah, I'm sure you'll find it, man. Yeah. Uh, I mean, was was Sly also a part of that gig then? Or have you ever come back to, to Sly? I'm not sure really what the story is there. Like, well, did well, he disappear? You know, there was different conviction, but I, I was playing with the Family Stone up until about two years ago, and then... It, um, it was myself and the original group was uh, Jerry Martini and Cynthia Robinson, female trumpet player, and myself. 
Right. So there were the three of us, and then she passed a couple years ago. Right. And then I did it for a little while longer than um, Jerry and I had gone in different ways, ended up on different pages. And uh, so, you know, I still go out performing the music of Sly and the Family Stone mm. with different configurations. Uh, you know, the last show that I did before COVID hit and everything came to a halt was at the great american music hall in san francisco with um it was uh dumpster ivan neville's dumpster funk from he's from new orleans ivan and um tower of power mm -hmm. and myself and david garibaldi the drummer for tower of power right, right, right. and we did an evening of uh with that with dumpster funk and tower horns we did you know, some sly tunes with me performing and then uh, David performed with, you know, Tower of Power mm. and um, the funk jam together doing some of the Tower of Power songbook. Cool. And very cold night, very, mm. very rainy. I remember it was a big storm, it was raining and, and but the place was uh, crowded, the vibe was great and nice. that was the last show I did live. That was wow. the last live yeah. performance, you know. Yeah, it sucks, man. I mean, uh, this pandemic has been awful. But you told me you're doing some some project called the Stick People. What, what was that, was that about? Uh, well, okay, uh, that's a good lead in because David's involved in this. Uh, <laughs> so there's five drummers. This is about five drummers. Oh, that's from what the called Stick People. <laughs> Hence, Stick, right? Mm. Five drummers from the Bay Area mm. during the musical renaissance of the late '60s, early '70s that time period we've been talking about. Mm. And and the five iconic group, groups, musics that they were part of creating. Mm. And those drummers are um, Michael Shreve from Santana, David Garibaldi from Tower Power, Mike Clark from uh, Herbie Hancock's group, Headhunters, mm -hmm. Lenny White from Miles Davis group, and myself. Cool. We've been doing three days of Skype interviews, not interviews, but we go, we go on Skype through to Monday, Wednesday, and Friday for an hour and a half each time since the end of February. We haven't missed one. Wow. There's no agenda. There's no script. It's just, we get together on Skype. We, and we tape it and, uh, not Skype, but uh, zoom. Zoom, right. So there's audio video of us, you know, mm -hmm. I guess, you know, we're all over the country and we talk about the musics that we created the experiences we had it we had all the different just everything and anything life it's politics sometimes <laughs> we try to stay away from that right uh and um it's absolutely phenomenal we've been having guests lately uh we got uh ivan neville coming up uh we got steve jordan coming up yeah yeah we just have them on, you know, and they mix with us, and it just makes for great conversations. But is that is this available on YouTube, or is it? Not yet. It's not available anywhere. Ah. But we're talking to different people about different possibilities. We were thinking of maybe a series, like you know, on Netflix or something. Hmm. But we may end up uh, starting out with like putting it like on YouTube, and and even doing where we could have people and you know Q&A kind of thing mm. but it's really cool we've had uh, O'Teal the bass player with the, he's playing with the dead right now mm -hmm. we've had uh, uh, Fred Wesley last week from James Brown uh, right. band trombone player and um, so it's it's it's, it's you know I, I joked early on when we started doing this to the guys mm -hmm. saying you know, this is our therapy, guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, kept the same through all this insanity that's been happening and um, absence of being able to go out and perform mm. and you know all that kind of stuff. Definitely. So, it's been very interesting. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool, man. I mean, I, I love to see if if it comes out on YouTube or or Netflix. Doesn't really I'll, matter. I'll, uh, I did it. We did a trailer, a teaser, kind of like just two minutes of just kind of like. Mm -hmm. What that is, you know, we, you know, right, right, uh, right. I'll send it to you. I can, put, maybe, I can even play it now. But I don't know. Would it make sense now or send it to you later? Yeah, just send me the link and, I, and I'll uh, share it so people can yeah. check it. That would be cool, right. man. Yeah. Awesome, man. I mean, did, did you ever, 
like go back and play with Larry at some point in time, or that ended oh, yeah. as well? Yeah, we've we've jammed and we've done things over the time. Uh, there's actually a couple of some opportunities to, for us to get together again. Cool, that would be uh, awesome to see. That that Carlos Santana has been mm -hmm. in my about. There was a possibility of the Woodstock 50 year celebration last year, but that's come and gone. And right. he's kind of taken a year or two off, just raised his grandkids, you know, he told me. And um, so there's, we, we speak, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, geez, Freddie went out with and did a, he did a song, uh, Sheila E put out a, a record. She did Everyday People, and she had Freddie cool. come and perform cool. with her. And, uh, Right, I've right. seen, her, yeah, on a video or two hmm. with her. You know, so the music lives. Nice, that's it, good. It keep reinventing itself every decade to, to new young people that weren't around when when we had did that. You know, so the experiences of Woodstock and you know all these different things. You know, hmm. uh, they weren't even there then, but it it still connects and still relevant. It shows up and. Yeah, I mean, I mean, that's, those, you know, exactly. I mean, that's how I found you, I guess. Like, Sly and the Family Stone was first, it was Red Hot Chili Peppers. Then you find out, oh, they yeah. like Funkadelic, and then you just like, oh, Sly and the Family Stone, you know, that's yeah, that's how, yeah. how it goes for a lot of people, I, I think. So the, you, the new, the, the, the young artists mm. that are coming up this decade kind of go back to what's influencing them, and you know, they'll do. They'll do one of our songs and have a hit with it, and then people find out where that actually came from. Yeah, exactly. So, the, yeah, that's how the reinvention seems to uh, the, connect. The, yeah. Or the uh, cartoon or movie or some, you know, Disney thing or exactly. a cover, even, you know. I mean, there is a, uh, an awesome cover of um, Sing a Simple Song, a, one of your songs, uh, that Tedeschi Trucks Band. Is uh -huh. doing. I don't know if you've seen it, but that's a, that's a great band. Yeah, 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 yeah that's a kick-ass cover, man. And if you haven't seen yeah. it, you should definitely check it out. Yeah, uh, and they're just killing it. So th I, I hope that also brings listeners. You know, like, oh, what's that? Sure, it does. It does. And uh, there was a, during the uh, 2006 that led up to that um, tribute to the Sly and the Family Stone mm. was all the contemporary artists of that time mm. had. Did a uh, a record uh, that Starbucks, you know, the coffee they they kind of like. Um, well, it was it was distributed through Starbucks, but what it was was a uh, all the contemporary artists had taken one of our songs. There were rap artists, rock artists, of everything, and they uh, they did a record. Hmm. With all these different artists doing one of our songs. Yeah, it's yeah, really. Yeah, yeah. Stuff, you know, so that there was their interpretation. In this case, they even used part of our tracks, right, so it was more right. just a sample. I mean, they used the tracks and then they sang over the top, hmm. and even with the group's performance all mixed in, you know, it's cool. pretty cool. I need, and, to, yeah, I need to check it out. It's probably YouTube, I guess, for people to check. Yeah, uh, hopefully, I forgot what it's called. I don't know if I have it sitting around. Yeah, but if you look, uh, um. Oh, what was the name of it? <laughs> Steve Jordan, I remember, because um, I'm friends with Steve. He he produced some of it. There was a couple different producers. Oh, okay. and, you know, this was, what, 15 years ago now? Well, yeah, time. that's true. <laughs> it's quite a long time ago. <laughs> yeah. uh, but, I mean, you mentioned uh, Woodstock, because I've heard your the live recording from Woodstock, and you guys just came out smashing it there, too. Yeah. Um, I mean, I know you get a lot of questions about Woodstock, I guess. Uh, but it's such a significant thing, you know. So, I mean, I feel bad if I don't ask you something about it. Uh, I mean, what do you remember from, from playing Woodstock? What was the experience just driving in, seeing all the people? Well, we didn't drive in. Right. Uh, <laughs> you could, the roads were blocked. So right. I came in. It was my first helicopter experience. Cool. And a big army helicopter it was frightening. Jeez. I mean, it was no, the whole side was open. You know, it just had wow. uh, fiberglass webbing mm -hmm. you know, so you didn't fall out, you know. Yeah, yeah. All noisy. And, but I remember uh, coming up over the hill and seeing that sea of people. It was, you know, you, you really felt like um, 
you can really feel it. I mean, it's a very powerful presence mm. being there. I mean, there's a reason why everybody still talks about Woodstock and like in awe. Uh, like I wish I was there. You know, it was one of a kind event. I imagine. Yeah. You know? Yeah. What was this? I mean, this is a random question, but being a sound engineer and knowing how much the sound, especially live, has improved, how was the sound on 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 playing live? Maybe it was like, was it bad? Like, could you hear people? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> uh, you know, um, you've heard the recording. I mean, it it was right. it, it 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 was crude in one way, but if uh, you know the groups that were. Uh, that had a powerful live performance presence, hmm. you just kind of overpowered and, you know, it was kind of like magic. You know, you, 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 you made something that didn't exist in a sense because your sound or your, your presence, uh, your performance was so powerful that it, um, it, you know, succeeded the shortcomings right. of the and values or lack of mm. that exist or that right. didn't exist then, you know. Yeah, so it left a lot, a lot of be, to be desired. Your, as a matter of fact, that was one of you know one of the things a lot of groups didn't want to do those those live outdoor concerts anymore, and some groups didn't do it. We were actually talked into doing more stuff. We weren't going to do it at first right. because there had been many you know outdoor festivals that, and they weren't fun to do. The sound wasn't good. Hmm. You know, you'd either you get rained on or the sun was beating you up in the, during the day and you're sitting there performing, or it'd be dusty or it'd be raining. You get electrocuted from the mic. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it wasn't fun, you know? So, uh, I, mean, I mean, it isn't like these days where, you know, the productions are top notch, you know, monitors, sound system, lighting, you're hmm. covered, you're, you know, it's everything is fine, you know? It was pretty crude back then but did you have a, a drum wedge even at Woodstock can you remember that or say that again like did you have a drum monitor like a wedge for, for yourself well, yeah. back then yeah I think yeah it was a small one it wasn't like big <laughs> stuff version, you know right right you know in, in, in your monitors mm -hmm. that wasn't happening uh, but we had our our live performance thing mm -hmm. to the best that we could make it at that time And, um, you know, I mean, there was a big sound system there. There were several banks of right. huge banks of speakers, you know, like at the stage and then back several hundred yards and then even back again. Mm -hmm. And they had them on time delay because the, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was so, it was so big. The space was so big that, you know, from when you hit something, it would be a couple seconds. <laughs> right, 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 right. They had to kind of delay the band. <laughs> it all kind of made sense. Mm. You know, it was the best that they could do in those days. But uh, there was magic there, too. I mean, the groups that, that you know, did their thing, uh, it, was, it was magical. You know, the Who played, and Hendrix played, mm. and Santana had played during the day. And uh, that was such an event that... Um, You know, if you if if you had something to say, that was the platform in which you know you were going to make your statement, and it was going to be unique, and it's mm -hmm. going to be you know bigger than life. Yeah, and that's what it was about. You know, exactly. all those kinds of things, just the gathering of all those people, and the the fact that it all worked, and there was no you know problems per se, uh, as far as you know, get usually when you had large gatherings of people like that, there were it, problems, you know, mm -hmm. issues. And uh, it was really a magical weekend. Yeah, you know? I can imagine. Very, yeah, it was. But did you yeah. get to meet Hendrix, or was that on a different day? Well, we were not that not that day. Matter of fact, I had left by the time he played. But uh -huh. we were on tour um, after that in in Europe, hmm. in England, the uh, Isle of Wight Festival, Furman Island, Germany. We had did several. We toured together. Oh, you used to tour with Hendrix, you said? Yeah. Ah, yeah. okay, cool. Yeah. That must have been a cool experience too, I guess. <laughs> It's wonderful. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it was. How how was he as as a as a private man? Do you remember that or? Yeah. 
he was shy. Yeah. Soft spoken, shy. Mm -hmm. The antithesis of, you know, when he hit the stage, you know, I mean, he became bigger than life. And yeah, and he was, you know, personally, he was very soft spoken. Mm. Yeah. I mean, there was, um, I saw the other day, there's a new clip uh, from the Hendrix camp um, yeah. that came out on YouTube from a, from a concert he did in Maui. Uh, so it was mm. like a new Blu-ray thing, whatever it is. Um, what year, what time period was that? Uh, it was like yep. seven, 70, yep. just, I mean, just before he died, I think, uh, oh, yeah. I don't remember when he died. It was 71. Was it 70? Yeah, we were, uh, we, I think the last concert was, I think it was Furman Island, Germany. Mm. Uh, he died like six or seven days after that show. Wow. That he passed. Wow. Uh, like a week and a half later. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this, that must have been a big shock even back then, I guess. Sure it was, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it was. Hmm. Um, I mean, going back to Sly, um, are you still, guys still in contact? Because I'm a bit uh, lost in like what, what happened. I don't know if you want to share it, if it's really bad. or but What's the situation there, if I can ask? Uh, you know, he's. I, I don't talk to him often. His daughter, Fun, uh, keeps in probably the closest contact with him. And... Uh, He's down in Los Angeles. Um, you know, he's not performing anymore. He mm. can't perform anymore. And, um, you know, he's just doing his thing and watching Netflix and <laughs> just chilling, you know. Right, right. Uh, it would be, you know, people ask all the time, could you get him out to perform? And, uh, mm. and I just did. I was speaking to Narda Michael Walden, producer and drummer, the other day. And, he was pulling my shirt tail about doing that. And I go, I don't think it's going to happen, but you know, I always leave the door open possibilities. Yeah. Miracle. Exactly, man. <laughs> we, we can, yeah, we can only hope, I guess. Uh, but it's, yeah. it's nice to hear that you're still in touch, you know, keeping the friendship yeah. uh, open at least, you know, yeah, that's important. There was a, uh, some people had uh, staged a, uh, up in Oakland a couple of years ago. A tribute with us, and we got together, and they filmed it. That's and that's on, uh, I believe that's on YouTube. Mm. Uh, and when that record that's in back of you, uh, Live yeah, at the yeah, 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 that came out. Uh, Columbia Records had arranged for us to get together. They wanted to film a day of us get just hanging out and talking. So I had uh, arranged for Fantasy Studios up in Berkeley here. And they sent the film crew, and we went up there, and they did interviews the whole day. You know, nice. it was that. That was the last. I think the, probably the last time they were all together. Right. And uh, that stuff is all on YouTube too. And there's there's one point where they where we went into the studio booth, and they put on the old master tapes, mm. the track mm. like them. Thank you, came. It was thank you, everyday people, a couple of, but thank you came up on them, pulling up the faders, and we're all like kind of grooving with like listening to the original tracks, and uh, Freddie and Sly, and everyone start singing like this a new interpretation of thank you while it was going on, and kind of improvising with it. It was very cool, right. and that's all on. Uh, oh, it is. I need to, I need to check that out. Yeah, well, that's really cool, man. Yeah. Um, but Greg, it's been a big pleasure talking to you. And, you know, first of all, thanks for the, the music you guys made. You know, you inspired countless of people. Uh, so, yeah, thanks for that. Um, My pleasure. You too. It's, it's great. I, I, it's, it's good to, uh, when I do, I've, I've done several of these kind of things, and it's always good to just kind of like, uh, you know, just have no agenda, kind of like the stick people do, just go on and let it let it fly, you know, and go wherever it goes. Exactly. And that's what we used to do with the music too. That's why it was so fun. Yeah. You know? yeah. yeah. Perfect, man. Yeah, yeah. But Greg, yeah. Thank you. Thank you again for coming on. It was a yeah pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you, Greg, for coming on. It was a super huge pleasure talking to you and I hope you, the listener enjoyed it as well. Feel free to leave a comment uh, below, letting me know what you think about the interview. Uh, if there's a guest you'd like to see in the show, 
Let me know. Just leave a comment. Also, check out Sly and the Family Stone, of course. Spin some of the old records. If you haven't heard them, you should definitely go check them out. Also, uh, feel free to join the Audio Tribe. Again, get exclusive access to interviews before the public. A uh, um, chance to ask questions to up-and-coming guests. And all that sort of cool things. Uh, just hit the link um, and your name and email address. You have joined. Also, feel free to subscribe to the YouTube channel, Apple Podcasts, Spotify to help the channel grow and get more and more guests on the show. Uh, but that's it for this week. Thank you, Greg, and thank you for listening or watching. I'll see you next week. So take care.